A reading of the Aeneids by Plotinus Translated by Stephen McKenna Published by the Penguin Group The Third Aeneid Second Tactate Providence First Treatise to make the existence and coherent structure of this universe depend upon automatic activity and upon chance is against all good sense. Such a notion could be entertained only where there is neither intelligence nor even ordinary perception. And reason enough has been urged against it, though none is really necessary. But there is still the question as to the process by which the individual things of this sphere have come into being, how they were made. Some of them seem so undesirable as to cast doubts upon a universal providence. And we find, on the one hand, the denial of any controlling power, on the other, the belief that the cosmos is the work of an evil creator. This matter must be examined through and through from the very first principles. We may, however, omit for the present any consideration of the particular providence, that beforehand decision which accomplishes or holds things in abeyance to some good purpose and gives or withholds in our own regard. When we have established the universal providence, which we affirm, we can link the secondary with it. Of course the belief that after a certain lapse of time a cosmos previously non-existent came into being would imply a foreseeing and a reasoned plan on the part of God providing for the production of the universe and securing all possible perfection in it. A guidance and partial providence, therefore, such as is indicated, but since we hold the eternal existence of the universe, the utter absence of a beginning to it, we are forced, in sound and sequent reasoning, to explain the providence ruling in the universe as a universal consonance with the divine intelligence to which the cosmos is subsequent, not in time, but in the fact of derivation in the fact that the divine intelligence preceding it in kind is its cause as being the archetype and model which it merely images, the primal by which, from all eternity, it has its existence and subsistence. The relationship may be presented thus. The authentic and primal cosmos is the being of the intellectual principle and of the veritable existent. This contains within itself no spatial distinction and has none of the feebleness of division, and even its parts bring no incompleteness to it since here the individual is not severed from the entire. In this nature inheres all life and all intellect, a life living and having intellection as one act within a unity. Every part that it gives forth as a whole. All its content is its very own, for there is here no separation of thing from thing. No part standing in isolated existence estranged from the rest, and therefore nowhere is there any wronging of any other even among contraries. Everywhere one and complete, it is at rest throughout and invites difference at no point. It does not make over any of its content into any new form. There can be no reason for changing what is everywhere perfect. Why should reason elaborate yet another reason, or intelligence another intelligence? 
An indwelling power of making things is in the character of a being not at all points as it should be, but making, moving, by reason of some failure in quality. Those whose nature is all blessedness have no more to do than to repose in themselves and be their being. A widespread activity is dangerous to those who must go out from themselves to act. But such is the blessedness of this being, that in its very non-action it magnificently operates, and in its self-dwelling it produces mightily. By derivation from that authentic cosmos, one within itself, there subsists this lower cosmos, no longer a true unity. It is multiple, divided into various elements, thing standing apart from thing in a new estrangement. No longer is there concord unbroken, hostility too has entered as the result of difference and distance. Imperfection has inevitably introduced discord, for a part is not self-sufficient, it must pursue something outside itself for its fulfillment, and so it becomes the enemy to what it needs. This cosmos of parts has come into being not as the result of a judgment establishing its desirability, but by sheer necessity of a secondary kind. The intellectual realm was not of a nature to be the ultimate of existence. It was the first and it held great power, all there is of power. This means that it is productive without seeking to produce. For if effort and search were incumbent upon it, the act would not be its own, would not spring from its essential nature. It would be like a craftsman producing by a power not inherent but acquired, mastered by dint of study. The intellectual principle, then, in its unperturbed serenity, has brought the universe into being by communicating from its own store to matter, and this gift is the reason form flowing from it. From the emanation of the intellectual principle is reason, an emanation unfailing as long as the intellectual principle continues to have place among beings. The reason principle within a seed contains all the parts and qualities concentrated in identity. There is no distinction, no jarring, no internal hindering. Then there comes a pushing out into bulk. Part rises in distinction with part. And at once the members of the organism stand in each other's way and begin to wear each other down. So from this, the one intellectual principle and the reason form emanating from it, our universe rises and develops part and inevitably are formed groups concordant and helpful in contrast with groups discordant and combative, sometimes of choice and sometimes incidentally, the parts maltreat each other, engendering proceeds by destruction. Yet, amid all that they affect and accept, the divine realm imposes the one harmonious act each utters its own voice, but all is brought into accord, into an ordered system, for the universal purpose, by the ruling reason principle. This universe is not intelligence and reason like the supernal, but participant in intelligence and reason. It stands in need of the harmonizing because it is the meeting ground of necessity and divine reason. Necessity pulling towards the lower, towards the unreason, which is its own characteristic. 
while yet the intellectual principle remains sovereign over it. The intellectual sphere alone is reason, and there can never be another sphere that is reason and nothing else, so that, given some other system, it cannot be as noble as that first. It cannot be reason, yet since such a system cannot be merely matter, which is the utterly unordered, it must be a mixed thing. Its two extremes are matter and the divine reason. Its governing principle is soul, presiding over the conjunction of the two, and to be thought of not as laboring in the task, but as administering serenely by little more than an act of presence. Nor would it be sound to condemn this cosmos as less than beautiful, as less than the noblest possible in the corporeal. And neither can any charge be laid against its source. The world, we must reflect, is a product of necessity, not of deliberate purpose. It is due to a higher kind engendering in its own likeness by a natural process. And nonetheless, a second consideration, if a considered plan brought it into being, it would be no disgrace to its maker, for it stands a stately whole, complete within itself, serving at once its own purpose and that of all its parts which, leading and lesser alike, are of such a nature as to further the interests of the total. It is, therefore, impossible to condemn the whole on the merits of the parts which, besides, must be judged only as they enter harmoniously or not into the whole. The main consideration, quite overpassing the members which thus cease to have importance. To linger about the parts is to condemn not the cosmos, but some isolated appendage of it. In the entire living being, we fasten our eyes on a hair or a toe, neglecting the marvelous spectacle of the complete man. We ignore all the tribes and kinds of animals except for the meanest. We pass over an entire race, humanity, and bring forward thersites. No, this thing that has come into being is the cosmos complete. Do but survey it, and surely this is the pleading you will hear. I am made by a God. From that God I came perfect above all forms of life, adequate to my function, self-sufficing, lacking nothing. For I am the container of all, that is, of every plant and every animal, of all kinds of created things, and many gods and nations of spirit beings and lofty souls and men happy in their goodness. And do not think that while earth is ornate with all its growths and with living things of every race, and while the very sea has answered to the power of soul, do not think that the great air and the ether and the far-spread heavens remain void of it. There it is that all good souls dwell, infusing life into the stars and into that orderly eternal circuit of heavens which, in its conscious movement, ever about the one center, seeking nothing beyond, is a faithful copy of the divine mind and all that is within me strives towards the good, and each, to the measure of its faculty, attains. For from that good all the heavens depend, with all my soul and the gods that dwell in my every part, and all that lives and grows, 
and even all in me that you may judge inanimate. There are, it would seem, degrees of participation. Here no more than existence, elsewhere life, and in life sometimes mainly that of sensation, higher again that of reason, finally life in all its fullness. We have no right to demand equal powers in the unequal. The finger is not to be asked to see. There is the eye for that. A finger has its own business, to be finger and have finger power. That water extinguishes fire and fire consumes other things should not astonish us. The thing destroyed derived its being from outside itself. This is no case of a self-originating substance being annihilated by an external. It rose on the ruin of something else, and thus in its own ruin it suffers nothing strange, and for every fire quenched, another is kindled.